Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York City jazz composer, pianist, actor, dancer, and public speaker, the great Harold O'Neill. He talked about his majestic, big sound on his new 2020 CD, Once Upon a Time. So he was born in Tanzania and raised in Kansas City. He's got some deep local roots in KC. His great-grandfather was a jazz pianist and composer, and his grandmother walked to school with Charlie Parker. He started playing piano at four on a miniature keyboard his father bought. Him. He went on to the great school, the Paseo Academy of Fine and Performing Arts, and would go on to learn from the great Bobby Watson and tour the world with him. Then he went on to the Berkeley College of Music, and all of his dreams started to happen when he went to New York City. In fact, he got there right before 9-11 in 2001. He's full of insights, wisdom, and stories, so please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Okay, Harold, hey, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. No fun at all. You know, you, I know you you were uh, raised here in KC. You gotta you gotta understand this town's going crazy for this football game. Oh my God! Yeah, I happen to be in KC uh, for the last playoff game. Man. Yeah. It, this last two weeks, I went down to Union Station last night. They got a big display that you could take your picture in front of. But I thought I'd take the family down. I mean, the first time in fifty years. Let's go in and get a picture, no big deal. That place was jam-packed. There was hundreds of people. There was, you know, all, all in exciting mode. It was cool. Very cool to see Kansas City in this life. My dad in particular has been waiting for this his whole life. When I was in high school, I was a diehard fan. You know, so this is, uh, <laughs> I'm still processing it. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. So... Harold, again, thank you for taking a minute out, and I've really enjoyed listening to this album, and I can only imagine the the enjoyment I'm getting out of such a large theatrical level of feeling that I get from this, this album. That has to be the way you feel to a certain degree about putting this together. Oh, yeah, it was an absolute joy, and uh, it did not take years to record it, but this album itself was years in the making. You know, I've been longing to uh, create something with this sound scope, you know, for a long time. And uh, now I'm, I've been finally able to do it, and uh, it's exciting, you know. And uh, you know, can't wait for more of the world to hear it. You know, the one thing that's always very evident about you is you're a consummate artist. You're a composer, pianist, actor, dancer, and a public speaker. So would you say that you kind of have a restless spirit or... Does your creativity mutate in all kinds of different directions and you have to do it to satiate your itch? Yeah, definitely satiating, satiating the itch. Uh, you know, I've always been a dreamer and I've always been ambitious. And while the cards were not always stacked in my favor, I never lost my optimism. Uh, for that, for much of that, uh, I have my grandmother to thank. Uh, Florine O'Neill and you know she always you know, no matter where we were she always instilled that core belief in me yeah so you know talking about the album you know uh, I've been putting out solo piano work that uh, that's in this world in this sound while I'm so happy with the work that's been done in that way uh, I wanted to expand the horizons you know and to, to make that happen I needed a larger Playground. Yeah. So you were born in Tanzania, and you come to Kansas City, you're raised here. Give me an idea of kind of your timeline uh, up to Kansas City, and I want to talk a little bit about your Kansas City area. So I uh, was born in Tanzania, Arusha, Tanzania. My dad's from Kansas City. My mom's born and raised in a village in Arusha. And my dad met my mom in Tanzania. Uh, I know this isn't new news necessarily, but my uncle Pete O'Neill was uh, the founder of the Kansas City chapter of the Black Panther Party, and my dad was a captain in the party. So that's how they ended up in Tanzania. Long story short, I was born, and uh, my mom, me, my mom, and my dad came to America when I was about when I was almost two years old. And I uh, grew up in KC. We lived with my grandmother, Florian, that I was telling you about. And, uh, you know, I first 
sat in front of a keyboard uh, when I was about four years old. And my dad had bought like a little mini board. I always thought it was his. But uh, it turns out that he bought that for me, no surprise. But being a kid, I always thought that was, that was his. And uh, I would just go and touch it, just go and play it. I did, wasn't taking formal music lessons, but I was in love with music. The way I describe that relationship is that I would never call myself a musician then. But if anyone asked me if I knew how to play the piano, I would say yes. I didn't see it as a profession or, you know, as a, you know, something that I did. But it was something that I felt that I always knew how to do. That's where right the on. first seed was planted, yeah. Right on. So, speaking of seeds being planted, what jazz music did you listen to in the beginning that really got you inspired? Like I was saying, you know, when I was four years old, I didn't identify with music in a certain way. And consequently, I wasn't even aware of genres. It was all just music. But the first album that I fell in love with, well, the first song I fell in love with was Pat Metheny's First Circle. And uh, it starts with this, uh, this syncopated clapping rhythm uh, over vocals. And I remember we would listen to that. My dad always listened to uh, a lot of different genres of music. So he would play that Pat Metheny album, and we would sit there trying to figure out the, the clapping rhythms to it. So that album was the first album I fell in love with. It happened to be a jazz album. But Pat Metheny's kind of, you know, has his own sound, you know, so it's jazz and a bit beyond. The first jazz piano album, so fast forward a bit, I, uh, you know, when I was 14, 15, about my first year of high school is when I said I wanted to be a career musician. I made that choice. I said, this is what I would do. Herbie Hancock's The New Standard. That was the, that came out in the mid-90s. That was the album uh, that led to me falling in love with Straight Ahead Jazz. Right mm-hmm. on. So when... When did you leave Kansas City? Did you always have this dream of moving on to bigger and, and greater things? I, I did, and, uh, you know, some people, you know, I know they probably had the best intentions for telling me not to shoot high. That didn't resonate with me, you know, coming where I came from. And other friends uh, and mentors were like, you know, shoot for the stars, go for it. So I left, I graduated high school in 99, uh, and I went to Berkeley College of Music for my first three semesters of college. And I came, took a semester off, came back to Kansas City, and then in 2001, right after I started playing with Bobby Watson, I uh, moved to New York in 2001. Well, that had to be one magnanimous time with 9-11. When, when did that happen for you? I, I moved to New York about a week, 10 days to a week before 9-11. And, uh, yeah. No, I always hear from uh, New York musicians that that event just permanently altered their entire lineage of what they were going to do as an artist and a human. Well, for me, so, yeah. So when, uh, when that happened, I was in the dorms of MSM, Manhattan School of Music. I was dorm, and uh, I was getting up to take a shower. And in the hallway, I see a few people gathered around, and I'm like, what's going on? And they said, you know, the misinformation was all over the place. So they were saying, you know, someone is in a plane, and they shot down a building downtown. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's crazy. That's weird. And I go and take my bath. Ain't nothing of it. Go in and take my shower, and I come out, and the hallway is just packed, just crowded. And, and now this, this information is even more exaggerated. And I thought to myself right away, and I looked out the window and could see the, the smoke cloud over the, over the site, and I thought to myself, my parents were right. <laughs> my parents were right. They would say, New York is dangerous. And for a moment, I thought to myself, what was I thinking coming here? Oh, my God. Well, I'm going to have to leave New York. I can't stay here. Yeah, wild. So Pretty scary. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, 
So before we leave Kansas City and Bobby Watson, you know, Bobby is stepping down and he's moving on to new levels. You know, Bobby was, has been such an instrumental figure in this town and he's brought so much good to the world. Talk to me a little bit about Bobby and how you feel about him. Oh, I love Bobby to death. Oh, my heart. A lot about my foundation as a jazz pianist uh, comes from Bobby, about how to play in a band. Bobby was the first cat to take me on the road. You know, right before September 11th, actually, I was in Israel, Bobby. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so Bobby was the first one to take me on the road. And actually, my sound as a pianist was really honed and developed in Bobby's band, uh, because when we were on tour, when we would tour Europe, Bobby would uh, let me open the set, open the night with a solo piano piece. That slot there was, uh, you know, crucial in me developing my solo piano sound, and he would push me to explore. I think maybe he, yeah, he knew I had that classical background. You know, he, he knew I came from that. Um, I should probably ask, I'd like to ask him what was going on for him when, uh, in my early days as a solo pianist when he would uh, push me in that way. Yeah, but there's, there's much that I have to thank Bobby for. So in 04, you premiere your quartet with Greg Osby, Jeff Kane Watts, and Matt Brewer, and your career has just taken off from there. You've done so many great things with so many great cats. What have you learned from the legends and luminaries over your time? What have you spoke from, e- from them either telling you things or showing you or just being around them? What have you got? Well, I'd say that uh, aside from all the musical things, well, it's mostly not about the music. It's not about the music. The music is just a vehicle for us to express and tell our story. You know, it's just a vehicle for us to express. The the most beautiful moment I have with Bobby is, you know, us just being human together. And the same with uh, Tane, you know, Tane is a friend. And, uh, you know, Andrew Hill, who I got to be really close with in his last years, you know, we rarely talked about music together. We rarely played music together. And it was more just hanging out. I remember hanging out with Andrew for like a holiday gathering with, uh, at his house with uh, him and his family and some other friends. But that's it. That's it. You know, it's just, it's not, a, it's about the music, but it's not about the music. You know, up to this point now, you've released a lot of albums. You've been all over the world. How do you feel about your career? Are you happy with where you're at? I'm, I am happy with where I'm at. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm in this place. I tell you what. It's not the way I thought it was going to be. It, when I saw that, it, when I first saw that it wasn't going to be the way I thought it would be, well, that transition is scary. That's a scary place to be in, you know. You know, but I'm I'm definitely real. I thought I was going to be as you know when I first moved to York. I thought my career was going to be in just playing straight ahead jazz in a band, and releasing piano trio albums, you know, maybe come different ensembles, but, you know, not, none of this venturing out, none of this uh, stepping into these different elements, not, especially not working with pop artists, you know, not working with rock rock artists, you know. Uh, yeah, it's really so... Now I'm just so curious, because it feels like, you know, it feels like a great beginning in a certain way. You know, the most different chapter in my life. Let me ask you this. What do you like best about being a musician? I don't have to clock in anywhere. Anywhere. You know, I feel like I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur in a sense. You know, when I, I, have, I do a lot of work in the social entrepreneur space and in the innovation scene. When talking with them, they, they feel like musicians. They feel like artists, you know. There's also a lot of uncertainty there, you know. You know, different instruments, but uh, but it's the same thing. You know, so I like, yeah, one thing about, and uh, I, I know that my path as a musician is not the typical beaten path. 
But uh, I like the flexibility and being able to connect with uh, people that, you know. And it's the same thing about, you know, finding these musicians who, at the end of the day, they're just human. You know, when I hang in the corporate world and in the entrepreneurial world, world uh, these folks are just human, too. And uh, it's there's a quote uh, by a woman who's, uh, who worked greatly inspires me. Her name is Virginia Satir. She was a pioneer of uh, family work and uh, considered to be the mother of family therapy. And uh, the quote is, we connect through what's the same and we grow from what's different. And having that as part of my core belief, I mean, there's so much opportunity. You know, the fact that things are not, didn't go the way I planned is about the best thing that could have ever happened to me. So I welcome it. Yeah, yeah. without a doubt. What, what was the first live jazz show you ever saw that really made you think, man, this is what I want to do in life? The first live jazz show I saw, I'd say that has to be, I think it was Ahmad Aladi. Yeah, I know that's another one who did a lot for me. Uh, you know, what, um, what a tremendous person to be around and, and you know, didn't even realize what we had. You know, but, um, yeah, we were seeing a lot of I think it was Chris, Chris Clark, you know, some of the KC heroes, the local KC heroes, uh, Amad Aldean, I think in his band at that time was Chris Clark, and uh, Tyrone Clark and Mike Warren. Yeah, I think that's who the band was at that time. And uh, I grew up right down the street. From uh, the Mutual Musicians Foundation. And uh, I remember, you know, people kept telling me about this place in the neighborhood, and eventually I was able to get there uh, during the day, and Ahmad and his band were rehearsing. And I made it a weekly uh, event for me to just come by and watch, and just watch them play. You know, and uh, I, I really enjoyed going to his gigs. I ended up working with him quite a bit, too, and, you know, doing a couple of albums with him. But, uh, you know, I remember really enjoying his shows, but I got the most from watching the rehearsals. That felt, right that felt like a special, in, special invitation privilege. Yeah, right mm-hmm. on. So, why do you love jazz? I love jazz. You know, it's a funny state we're in right now. It's trans, I feel it's a transition, you know. I feel it's a transition, you know, because of the history of the music, uh, it coming from uh, black American culture, you know, and my family, you know, being so active in the civil rights movement, it fits, you know, that I have this intimate connection with this music in this way, you know, and... uh, I'm in a transition with how I connect to the identity to, to what this music is and what it means. You know how I talked about, like, not I didn't, I was at a time where I didn't think I would look in all these different genres of music? You know, but if it's connected to that, that essence that we all have inside, if it's connected to that, then it's all the same thing. It's, it's all the same thing. It's, it's not necessarily about the genre, but the history is important. And uh, there are many ways that the music, it's, that the music shows itself and exists, you know, in all of these different, you know, different cultures. Such a significant part of American history. So I'm still sort of answering the question, you know, that's something I'm still finding every, I'm still finding and exploring every day. Some people would listen to my music and say it's not jazz. Some people would listen to that album and say it's not that. You know, some people would listen to, you know, my work and say it, it doesn't fit in those places. And I'm actually just fine with that. I'm actually just fine with that. I would like for someone to hear my music and feel the way that I felt when I was four years old and knew the music before it had a name. And just like the origins of many things with names, you know, uh, the history can be complicated. 
simple and complex balance of it being simple and complicated at the same time. I mean, but, you know, dance is the same that way. Uh, martial arts is the same that way. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, uh, you know, there's a time where, you know, martial arts, traditional arts could not be taught in the U.S. And people like, you know, people, not only Bruce Lee, but people like him, and people like Ed Parker and many others, were, you know, key figures in introducing it to the, uh, to the United States. And, you know, a lot of people did not agree with that. You know, but look where it is now. It's just something that's everywhere. But then you do have a lot of what we call mixed dojos, like McDonald's mixed dojos. You know, in yeah. belt size where, you know, they, you get a black belt. And I'm not venturing off the top of it, but there are the top threads. You know, you get, you get a black belt and, and, you know, without a story, you get a black belt without putting in the work. You know, but if it means something to them, who am I to say? That it's not what it is to them. And the same can be said for any art form and any cultural gift to the world. You know, where where does that separation begin? And where does that end? That's what I think about when I make music. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah right on. So let me ask you this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're leading your life. Who do you think you are? Hmm. Boy, oh boy. Um, hmm. I think I'm someone that's loving and someone that enjoys people's company. You know, it's okay to not, for me to not complicate that, who I am. I used to, I spent years thinking that I had to come up with some solid answer or some very well thought and defined answer. But the beauty is in the simplicity, you know. I'm someone who aspires to create and leave the world with something beautiful that can be treasured in the world. Sometimes I don't feel like doing that, and that's okay. You know, Joe, some days I don't play the piano. Some days I don't want to be a piano player. I'm talking about scratching that itch, not just genre-wise, but just in my, the way I live my life, it's all kind of goes, goes down to the same thing. There's times I don't want to play the piano, and times I don't want to be a piano player, you know? And that's, that's great. I advise anyone to, you know, explore that. You know, we are more than what we do. That's wonderful. Harold, man, this has been illuminating. Thank you for taking a minute out to talk about the new album. Good luck with it. I can't wait to get I can't wait for people to hear it more. It's a wonderful album. And thank you for thank all you. and being the representation of Kansas City. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joe. This was great, and I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Harold for his time, cool, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.